sponsored by the James Madison Council. Hi, and welcome to the 2021 Library of Congress National Book Festival. I'm Lori Siegel. I am a correspondent for 60 Minutes Plus and CBS News, also the founder of Dot 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 Media, which looks at the intersection of tech and culture. So I have to say, as someone who has covered tech for over a decade, um, I could not be more excited for this panel. I'm here with Anna Weiner, the author of Uncanny Valley, and Sarah Fryer, author of No Filter. Um, these are two books that really capture an important moment in history. This is the second wave of technology that shapes society and all of us, uh, and they both get into the complications that came along with it. They're very complimentary. Um, so to learn more about Sarah and Anna, you can check out uh, the website loc.gov slash bookfest. And before we start, uh, I want to let everyone know that we're going to save the last 10 minutes. We're going to speak for 20 minutes, and then the last 10 minutes uh, we have for questions. So please ask questions, submit questions. I know um, these, these women want to hear from you. And so start submitting questions now. Um, so Anna and Sarah, welcome. Welcome, guys. Thank you um, so much for having us. I was just saying, what a dream team. I mean, you, you both have books that really cover such an important moment in, in history. Um, this era of startups and disruption as they were becoming mainstream. Um, for both of you guys, just to start out, what was appealing about you know, about the subject, about the tech boom. I know, Anna, for you, you went um, and actually worked at multiple startups, even with this background, you wanted to get into writing and you ended up, your journey took you to San Francisco for startups. And, um, you know, you've covered technology, Sarah, for so long. I followed your work for so long in the, in the tech space. So what was appealing about it for you guys? I think that's something that runs as a theme through, through, and as personal writing and my uh, reporting is like in the tech world, there is this mythology that um, that is out there about success, about how things work, about how to win. And I think that um, what I attempted to do with the Instagram story is take this app that you know people just thought this was just a perfect acquisition bought by Facebook for a billion dollars which was just unheard of at the time. What a success. You know, they got to have their company within Facebook, pretty much a separate company, none of the risk, all of the reward, everything's great. Well, you know, once you dig behind the scenes, actually it wasn't that great. And there was a lot of tension with Facebook and a lot of implications for how we live today based on the decisions that were made by the Instagram founders and um, things that just were not as perfect as they sounded in the press. And so I think the Instagram story was a very, if not untold, then undertold story, um, an app yeah. that is so powerful and yet so under scrutinized. Um, and, and I think that that's, that's what drew me to it. Yeah. And I mean, and are you, I love how uh, the book kind of opens up with these, these dreams. And I think a lot of us can relate to coming to New York and our dream is one thing and you end up in San Francisco working at, uh, at a tech company. Um, so what was it that was so appealing to you at the time? Well, I was coming from East Coast Book Publishing and I was really looking for a career shift that would feel like it had a future, that it had momentum. Um, I worked at a, an ebook startup very briefly in New York and then moved to San Francisco and just was sort of intoxicated by the speed at which things moved and the way that I, you know, individual employees really felt like they were having an impact despite being um, quite young and inexperienced. And I think that like Sarah was saying, this there was a lot of mythology around Silicon Valley at the time. And I was sort of ambiently aware of that, but I absolutely bought into it um, because that, you know, it was in the culture, it was very pervasive. And I started writing about it mostly as a way to sort of process the, the distance between all of this mythology and all of this enthusiasm and excitement and my own experiences as a low level employee at some of these tech companies. Um, so I, I, I went into it really with no intention of covering, of, of writing about, I mean, covering is such a journalism term. Um, this was not my world at all. It was really this, I wanted a career shift um, and ultimately found that writing about it was a much more comfortable place for me to be. And uh, but but it really I sort of fell into it backwards in that way. Um, it's a it, I think that 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 distance has narrowed 
over the last few years between expectation and reality and mythology and reality. Yeah. But, um, you know, thanks to, <laughs> thanks to reporting by people like Sarah and like you, Lori. Yeah. But um, yeah, I think that that's really what drew me in, in in the first place. I think that's one of the things that struck me about both of y'all's books, right? We all kind of grew up in, in these different ways, right? I created our startup beat at CNN back in, I think it was like 2009. And, you know, you say it in your book and it's like two years in, in startup years, everything moves so quickly. And Sarah, you covered that. Um, and we see so many changes and there was this certain period of time, there was a mythology, right? Where we we're moving fast and breaking things. This was the era of disruption. And Sarah, you describe um, Instagram and this one story that the public and the media, myself included, by the way, I remember sitting on CNN and being like, it's sold for a billion dollars. Like, can you believe it? You know, this was unheard of at the time to Facebook. You really got in there and unveiled like the craziest, most fascinating story of Instagram behind the scenes. What was it about Instagram that you were like, okay, we've got to know more about this company because Facebook has been scrutinized pretty much and now Instagram's owned by Facebook. And then I'm curious as someone who has dealt with Facebook, how did you deal with the roadblocks and reporting and really kind of getting the story and getting in there? Yeah, so Instagram, I just... I just thought that there's no other app that has such a hold over our culture. It's not just about what we do on our phones and what we do on our on the internet in general. It's about what we do in the, our real lives. And Instagram is changing human behavior. It's changing our perception of popularity, of of um, celebrity, of entrepreneurship, yeah. of all these things. Um, people who are young now, you know, they, they see being an influencer as a path for themselves, or they're comparing themselves to other people on Instagram. Um, and, and so I just, I wanted to understand that connection between the decisions a company makes and the decisions that we all make as humans, you know, using their product. And it really all went back to that idea of, of growth, this Silicon Valley, um, just obsession with getting more users, more attention, and this kind of product um, product pathway that is like, as long as you can get big enough and get enough attention, then you can just sell advertising off of it. And for, um, for Instagram, um, the way that they managed to do that while also planting seeds in our culture and deciding who would become famous and um, figuring out like what they wanted w to be cool. I, that was just so, so, so un Silicon Valley to me. Um, the fact that, you know, Twitter and Facebook are always just like, oh, we're just a reflection of humanity. No, Instagram was warping humanity um, for good and for bad. And I, I really wanted to dig into that. Was there anything like rolling up your sleeves when you got in and you interviewed someone like, take us to one of these interviews? What was the thing that someone said that you were like, oh my God, I cannot believe that, you know, that this happened behind the scenes at Instagram? Oh my gosh, there's so many things. I mean, like hearing the stories of how they um, bent over backwards for certain celebrities. Um, hearing the stories of, of how they really were kingmakers of um, deciding who would become famous and not. Um, but then also uh, the story with Facebook, the tension with Facebook. One of the stories that really jumped out to me early on is when Instagram finally joined Facebook, those first few weeks of integration, um, Facebook wasn't sure if they wanted to help them grow. Uh, first, they had to devise a study to figure out if Instagram was a competitive threat to Facebook. Here they spent this ungodly amount of money on this company and they were willing to let it die if it was any threat to Facebook. And of course that was just foreshadowing for what would happen later. Um, and the most shocking thing that I uncovered in my book was that ultimately Mark Zuckerberg still uh, stunted Instagram's growth. Um, once he saw that Instagram was potentially taking eyeballs away from Facebook, around when Facebook's turmoil really started to, to heat up and in the post 2016 election period, he was thinking, okay, we have given Instagram all these resources. Now it's time for them to boost Facebook. And now Instagram's job really is to be a funnel of attention into Facebook Inc. Um, whereas previously it, it was trying to attempt to be independent. Um, but the fact that he could just do that to a company that, that he owned and, and, 
it just right. gives, gives me a sense of how the company feels that they can manipulate our behavior any way that they want. It doesn't really matter what is popular. Yeah, I think the humanization, and this is for both you and um, and Anna, the humanization of, of the tech leaders, even though, Anna, it's so funny, in, in your book, you don't actually say the names, right? You'll talk about the micro blogging company. You'll talk about... I think you refer to Facebook as um, the social network everyone hated. <laughs> I don't know if it's Facebook, you can confirm or deny. Um, but you, even though you don't um, really refer to folks or companies by name necessarily, there's a lot of humanization there. Um, and I, there is this line in your book, you said, I moved to San Francisco at the age of 25 for a job in tech and I lived to write about it. Um, which, you know, this really is a coming of age story. Um, and I relate to it in many ways in that I came of age covering technology. So I read as you came of age behind the tech, the doors of a, of a tech company, and you could really sense in the book, you're struggling with these kind of what you want to be doing, what you think you should be doing. How would you describe that inner conflict that you had that's so apparent in the book um, when you were, quote, on the inside? Well, I think that this has a lot to do with the culture inside of many startups in particular. I, I would imagine that it's maybe a little bit different at a larger company like Apple or Google or even Facebook. Um, but there is this sense that the work you are doing is not only incredibly important and crucial, but potentially the most important and crucial work one could be doing yeah. in their 20s. And I think that that is um, often in, you know, sort of in service of having people work longer hours and work harder for the company and uh, feel really committed but it's also it's, it builds camaraderie and I think that that sense of importance is often um, when a company is doing well it is affirmed by your revenue stream you know you see money coming in it feels like you're making something useful um, and that feels unbelievable especially as someone who's quite early in their career and um, speaking for myself, at least, quite inexperienced. Uh, and so I think that that can be very seductive, um, almost to the extent of obliterating any questions one might have about whether the work itself is actually valuable or advancing a, uh, a set of values or a culture that you agree with. Um, and also then the more personal question of whether or not it's right for you. So I think, just speaking for myself, uh, I was working at a data analytics company. It was building a tool that helped people, um, helped other app and website makers sort of optimize for certain things on their, on their sites and understand user behavior better. And I sort of wanted to move away from, from this in sort of a, a value set of, you know, everything should be optimized and streamlined and kind of um, experience should be controlled. So that's just sort of one, one example for, for me, but um, that was why I, I, one of the reasons I left um, that particular company. I don't know if that answers your question exactly. Yeah, I, you know, I also think, um, I'm curious for both of you as women, um, I, we've done the whole Silicon Valley sexism conversation for probably as long as I've covered tech, which is over a decade. And I can't decide if it's getting better or worse, truthfully. Uh, even though there's a lot of folks talking about it. And there was, um, you really, you tackled it in a certain way um, in Uncanny Valley. You, um, you said being the only woman on a non-technical team providing customer support to software developers was like immersion therapy for internalized misogyny. I mean, what a statement. It, it was pretty extraordinary to see your experience um, within the, these companies, multiple companies, and the sexism in Silicon Valley. When you set out to write the book, um, how, and I know I've struggled with, by the way, because I've, I've been writing a book that comes out next year, and I've struggled with how to get that conversation about sexism right because it is in so many different facets in Silicon Valley where it's all made out to be a meritocracy. So how did you, what was your experience with it when you were behind closed doors there? And then how did, you know, what did, how did you want to describe it in the book? What did, you know, what kind of conversations did you have when, when thinking about how you were going to characterize it? Sure. So I think my experience of sexism was that it was pervasive and often subtle um, for me, at least. I think it was quite unsubtle for a lot of people that I worked with and a lot of other women in tech. Uh, but in writing the book, I, and this, this, uh, this goes for writing about sexism or writing about the sort of political dimension of technology or other dynamics in the office and in the industry, I really wanted to 
steer as far away from um, being polemical as possible. And hopefully I was successful in that. I, I, I wanted to just explain what had happened to me, detail my experiences, and let the reader sort of come to their own conclusions based on the material at hand, you know, my observations, my feelings about it. Um, obviously there's a bias there, but I think that it can be really hard not to move into a sort of a, a more didactic or polemical mode. And um, I think for me, it was, it was more important to just detail how I had, you know, how I had experienced it in my actual life. But I think this is a difference between journalism, opinion, memoir. Um, yeah. I think that's the sort of liberty one can take when writing uh, personal nonfiction. And Sarah, I'm curious for your own experience. You're, you've covered the startup world for a very long time. You've covered, covered these companies, you've written extensively now about Instagram. Um, what is your take on, on the problem? Do you think things have gotten better with sexism, with you know, diver, with, when it comes to representation? I don't think representation has has gotten better. I think the the companies have started to release more internal statistics. They started to um, do what they're required to do and in terms of adding women to their board. Um, but you, you still get the sense that um, companies say that they're not willing to compromise their, um, their wish to have the best of the best doing the job. And they simply aren't considering people who may be the best of the best, but just didn't get to have that kind of a network um, to get in front of the person. And personal relationships are so key here. I think as a journalist, um, you do kind of get underestimated. Um, people assume that you'll be more gentle because you're a woman and, or that you don't know things from a technical level because you're a woman. And um, hopefully um, over time, I've been able to prove them wrong, but it does, it does, as you know, sometimes give an advantage in reporting because people will tell you things expecting that, um, that there's no way you would do anything with them. But, you know, yeah. you say, I'm doing this on the record. I, um, I very much re relate to that from reporting over the stuff back, back in the day. I've, I've always seen a bit of a double standard too, with how, uh, founders speak to female journalists and male journalists. It's been interesting to see. Um, I'm curious, because we have you here, um, Sarah, and because it's been like a big week of news for Facebook. Um, and by the way, what's not a big week of news for Facebook these days? But, you know, I think the, the Wall Street Journal recently uh, obtained an internal uh, study conducted by Facebook, and it paints a, a pretty bleak picture of the detrimental uh, effects of Instagram on its younger users. There's obviously controversy because this was never made public. It also shows that what we've all been asking Facebook as journalists, politicians have asked this question, is this detrimental to the mental health of our, um, of our children to some degree? And, you know, and we haven't really heard much from Facebook on this. So I'm curious for your thoughts uh, on, on the latest Facebook news and, and will it impact the bottom line? Well, that last question is the key, right? Um, because I think yeah. that over and over, there has been wake up call after wake up call about this. For employees internally at Instagram, they have known since at least 2015 when they started studying the issue that anxiety for teens, um, body image, comparing oneself to others, that popularity contest was a problem. In fact, it was a problem so much for the company that it, it affected growth. And, and that's where you see it in the bottom line for Instagram, if people are too anxious to post on Instagram, um, if they're too worried about what people will think of them and they post less, that's bad for business. But they've been able to make enough product tweaks that that is no longer a problem. Stories, copying stories, the 24 hour disappearing post from Snapchat was something that really boosted them um, out of that, that growth problem with anxiety, but they didn't do anything about the human problem and I think it, it goes back to what Anna was saying about when you're at a tech company, you're seeing those metrics go up and up and up. It's easy to think, well, we're doing something right. If people are using our product more, they must like it. They must feel like they're getting value out of it. They must feel good. Um, and, and, the, and it's really internally people have who have studied this on the research team it, and who specifically work on teens have seen actually yeah, that's not necessarily true. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, um, I'm curious for both of you guys. Writing a book is no small feat. Um, you know, it, 
it's certainly for you. I'm curious, Sarah, how, how long did it take you to do the research for, for no filter? Well, I had this background covering Facebook for many years. Um, and people were like, well, you could probably just write the book on Instagram without any extra right. reporting. No, you couldn't because there's, there's so much we didn't know about the app and about its internal story. So, so much in the book is new. Um, my, my colleague and boss, Brad Stone told me you have to get like a hundred things that nobody knows, and then you have a book. And so that's really what I tried to do, um, through my interviews and, and in-depth reporting and, that took took several months. Of course, I had a, a book deadline. So I think I finished it all in 18 months, but um, but it definitely was a, a big lift. <laughs> a lot of conversations. Right. Thank you to all the people who talked to me. And by the way, in the time that you were doing the book, the Instagram founders quit. So I, I can imagine, um, you know, that that definitely turned things around again. And you probably had to keep doing tons of research and, and that made it even more relevant. Actually, yeah, I think that helped people understand that like the story of, of tension at Facebook was going to come out no matter what uh, at some point. And so they would might as well talk to me about it. Sure. And um, Anna, what about you? I mean, the book has so many details, right? I, I'm wondering if you just kept a notepad with you as you worked at, at the, these different startups throughout. Um, it is, there are so many vivid details in it. What was the hardest part of writing this book? Um, I think just figuring out what to include, uh, which stories were mine to tell. And I think there, there is a lot of detail in the book and I didn't really take notes in any normal way, but I had moved to San Francisco from New York and didn't really know anyone. And the way that I kept in touch with people was over email. So I did have this sort of trove of long emails, uh, to friends, just talking about my life and telling stories and, uh, those turned out to be extremely useful when I was sort of doing research for the book. Um, and I also interviewed former coworkers and read a lot of coverage from the time that I had been working in tech, but maybe wasn't necessarily paying that much attention to TechCrunch. Um, so that was all uh, very, very useful to me. But I think that um, it's also just, you know, figuring out what, what would go in there are certain, the, the book is just a fraction of my experiences. And so there were certain things that really stayed with me. And um, it seemed obvious that they should be in the book because there are things that I was thinking about six years later, you know? <laughs> so um, sure. I think I think that's probably a sort of quintessential memoir uh, question. Yeah, um, I wanna get to some user questions too. Um, Rob has an interesting question. Um, this is a, a new news question. What is your take on uh, the Elizabeth Holmes trial? What does it say about the world of startups, especially the ones led by women? Um, either of you, Sarah, if you want to take this, or Anna, either one. I'll I'll pass it to Anna. <laughs> I'm very curious what um, you have to think. Well, I think that the second part of that question is sort of interesting because I think that, um, and it's also interesting when we talk about sexism in tech. I think that. Uh, there has been an emphasis on, you know, is is the coverage of Theranos sexist? Is the way that Elizabeth Holmes is being portrayed sexist? Um, and I think in a lot of ways, we actually the, the story is about the incentives that people in her position have, and uh, what what leads a person to um, to to do what she did, and and you know, what are the sort the pressures that that person might be under? And I think that that is sort of gender agnostic in a way. Um, which is not necessarily, that's not to, <laughs> to excuse her, but to just to say that I think sometimes these conversations can sort of miss the forest for the trees um, in that, you know, would Facebook be better run if, if the CEO is a woman? Um, I assume not, <laughs> you know, I think, Sarah, I don't know if you have uh, a, a different perspective on this, but I, I often feel like the conversation about, um, about this can be a bit of a red herring. Like it's, it's actually just as important to look at the economic incentives and structure and the, the business model of these companies as it is um, who is running. When them. it comes to massive fraud, absolutely. I, I mean, I, th I think, you know, when it comes to women as founders in Silicon Valley, and, and maybe you've been thinking about this a lot, Lori, as you do your own research, um, I think that the, there is this expectation that they also be um, like, 
personalities uh, that people can follow, whether, especially on Instagram, you've seen the, um, the CEOs of Away, of Glossier, of, of um, all of these companies that, uh, or, you know, the wing, like they go on um, Rent the Runway, they go on Instagram and they have like this sort of influencer-esque side of their executive leadership. And so we're kind of asking double of, of women in those roles. We're asking them to be like, you know, the embodiment of their products. Um, and I don't know that we ask that of male leaders. We ask them to just keep the numbers going up. Yeah. Um, I'm curious, Sarah, for you, you talk a lot about Instagram um, at the beginning, right? And it was a certain product at the beginning when Kevin and Mike created it. Um, and then, you know, there was this idea that it was purchased by uh, Facebook and there was a long, for, for a while, Facebook was acquiring companies and the idea was that Mark Zuckerberg was just going to leave them alone. He thought Oculus, he's going to leave it alone. WhatsApp, he was going to leave it alone. This was this public narrative. And that didn't happen uh, down the line with Instagram. And you really get into this in the book about the tension that, that came along when Facebook really tried to utilize Instagram and whatnot. Um, it's a very different product than it was at the beginning of the acquisition. I'm curious, you know, what do you think we've got to worry about when it comes to the future of Instagram? What should we be paying attention to now that it's fully integrated with Facebook and we know some of the challenges that come, come along with Facebook? Well, I think one of the biggest problems is that it's never going to be the top priority for the company. And Instagram, I talked earlier in this conversation about how it has such a tremendous cultural cultural impact. And if Facebook is not thinking about that cultural impact, we're going to have a similar reckoning uh, with Instagram. Um, we are, I think we are starting to have a reckoning over Instagram's impact, its negative impact whether that's through the spread of vaccine misinformation or um, even you know, drug trafficking, human trafficking, um, mental health issues, body image issues, all of those things. The company has known about them, but the staffing, the way it's organized, um, Facebook takes priority. It's, it's like the, the thinking at Facebook is the most important problems to solve are the ones that affect the most people. Facebook is still a bigger product than Instagram. It's still a higher revenue driving product than Instagram, though Instagram is responsible for mo most of the revenue growth. Um, they are not gonna do anything to fix problems unless they become public crises. And we've seen that over and over and over with the company. Yeah. Um this is a question from Melinda. She says, I love that you use the same platform to promote the book as the subject of the book. Did you change the way you saw or used Instagram yourself? Actually, yes, um, because Instagram was the place of, you know, you know, as a journalist, Lori, we're, we're always on Twitter. That's just what we do. And, and I was on Facebook a lot because I, I covered Facebook and Instagram was a place where I was kind of just personal. Um, I'd post pictures of my wedding. I'd post pictures of my vacation. During this book project, project, it became a place to reach out to really interesting creators around the world, um, people who have, um, you know, teens who have really strong opinions about Instagram, um, people who could help drive my reporting um, because they come from different walks of influencer life or um, Instagram entrepreneur life or um, heavy user or, or former user or people who've had problems with the product. So now my Instagram is a place where I talk to people about their use of Instagram and people reach out to me from around the world after reading the book and say, you know, this is what this made me think of. This is a problem I'm having, or this is what I wish you would write about. And that's been, that's been really world opening. And I, I do appreciate that aspect of it. I think both of you guys talk in different ways about the attention economy and the, the business model of Silicon Valley and whatnot. And there's this great line. Um, we, there's kind of this turning point in, and the memoir where you decide it's, you know, you are going to leave at some point, you know, you, you can tell you're, you're really beginning to get jaded and you say, um, life in the attention economy has made me oblivious. Um, what did you mean by that when you wrote it? Oh, I think I just meant that I was very aware of a, um, a social media landscape that had been curated for me and uh, a little bit oblivious to what was happening outside of that. Was there a point 
was there a big breaking point for you where you just knew you wanted to leave Silicon Valley? You were really disillusioned by what you'd seen. Was there any specific event or was it kind of the culmination of a lot of things? I would call it a slow burn. Um, John wants to know, um, any idea how the corporate culture of tech firms is different in countries outside of the United States? TikTok comes to mind. Um, I'm not sure if this is something either of you guys, if either of you guys want to weigh in on. I don't feel personally qualified to answer that. Do you, Sarah? I mean, I think that that the model of Silicon Valley, I'll, I'll push this forward a little bit and say, sure. um, this these next few years are going to be a big experiment um, with more companies pivoting to work from anywhere. Um, whether Silicon Valley remains the the um, epicenter of tech talent, um, it's probably still going to remain the epicenter of tech culture. Um, but I think that we will start to see that culture homogenize a little bit as people are able to come work for these companies from anywhere. Um, and as the companies decide not to buy really expensive real estate in San Francisco and the surrounding area, and instead hire people wherever they live or wherever they want to live. Yeah, I think, and we have to wrap soon, but I'll say, I think we're in such an extraordinary moment uh, when it comes to this next iteration of technology and this next wave of tech. And, and you guys have both um, written pretty historical books, I think on this, this last wave of technology. Um, a lot of people talk about Web3, this idea that we're now entering a new era of technology with the metaverse and NFTs and cryptocurrency. And don't worry, I'm not going to ask like specifically about all of these things, but it does for me as someone who's covered technology, I'm like, oh God, we're just going to repeat all of these mistakes all over again if we're not careful. Um, but hopefully, but there's this idea that can we be optimistic? So for both of, to end it, I would like to ask both of you guys, um, are you optimistic about the future of tech and humanity? Because I think tech has become such a big part of humanity at this point. Are you optimistic? I'm optimistic about the fact that tech will become more and more convenient. I'm I'm pessimistic about what that will do for our information diet. Because as Anna said, you know, you become a passive user of these products. Um, when you Google something now, when you have an Amazon Alexa, eventually when you have it in your ear and you ask a question, you're just going to be served whatever answer algorithmically makes sense uh, for just to, to send you at the moment. And I, I really think that people have to think critically as we move into this era where tech becomes more passive, um, more served up to us on a platter of whatever they think we might want, whatever might increase engagement or revenue. Um, we have to to actually use these products mindfully and think, well, is this really answering my question? What is my intention as I've opened up this gaming system or, you know, what am I trying to accomplish? And if I'm just trying to waste time, like, what does that, what does that do for me? Sure. Anna, what do you think? Are you, are you optimistic? I, do I see a future of you going back into Silicon Valley to work for a startup? <laughs> You can, you'll see me on, on Web3. Um, I, I'm not optimistic, but I am hopeful, I think, constitutionally. And I think that it is very important to uh, remain hopeful that things can change. And so I think that that's sort of where I would come down on that question. Great, great. Um, you know, I was going to sneak in one last one because I think you guys are great. And I, I'd love to just have any details on will there be another book coming at any point? Sarah, if, are you going to take on another company? And Anna, what's going to be the next, you know, vividly written you know, book that you write? Anything of interest to you guys? Definitely want to write another book. I'm waiting for um, a story that is as undertold as, as the Instagram one and, and taking my time to do the right one. Because as you know, a book project can be all consuming. So I want to be um, appropriately obsessed. That's fair. I think I think to write a book, you have to be appropriately obsessed. It's not an easy process, I can imagine. Anna, how about you? Uh, I'm really excited to explore some of the same themes that I wrote about in Uncanny Valley. Um, ambition, youth, failure, wealth, um, but in fiction. <laughs> so I think that that will probably be the next book-length project that I uh, work on. 
Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much. Um, I'm sorry we're out of time because I could go on with you guys for a long time, but thank you, uh, Sarah and Anna, for sharing your time with us. Uh, and thanks uh, to the audience for all your questions. Keep enjoying the National Book Festival at loc.gov slash bookfest, and we'll see you guys soon. Thank you so much. This was a privilege. <laughs>